Uh, I'm Gareth Long. I uh, am the curator of this wonderful exhibition by Mr. Tony Conrad. Um, Tony, as I'm sure you all know, is uh, a man who wears many hats. He is a composer, musician, performer, artist, filmmaker, video maker. Um, I'm leaving educator, uh, thinker of thoughts, um, nice guy. Um, Gesamtkunst. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. As the um, word was invented yeah. there, yeah. I thought it works. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I couldn't have said it better. Um, and Tony has had exhibitions. Uh, he's been included in Documenta in the Venice Biennale. He's shown work at the Tate Modern, at MoMA in New York, PS1, um, poof, a lot of stuff. Um, so. It took a long time, but yes. It was worth the wait. Um, so, uh, let's talk about this show. Yes. You know, yeah. That we're sitting inside of. Yeah. Um, uh, yesterday we had a bit of a conversation, and I started by asking you about the title of this exhibition. This two degrees of separation. Yeah. Um, again, in English, the phrase is usually six degrees of separation. And I asked yesterday, and I, I kind of think you evaded it a little bit, mm -hmm. so I'm going to come back to you with it. But what happened to the other four degrees of separation? Or what are the two that we're talking about? Yeah, I don't know how this translates uh, directly that there are, uh, the, that is the expression six degrees of separation. How does that translate into German? Well, I mean, th what is was there... suggested here was this uber, how many other Zwecken, yeah. right? Uh -huh. I mean, uh -huh. so we chose Zweig because we were doing two degrees uh -huh. of separation. But, it, but. but the, the uh, yeah, but the idea in English is that uh, everyone uh, can be uh, connected to someone else who's connected to someone else who's connected to someone else and after you go through six that you reach everybody in the world and uh, so this uh, piece uh, this work here it obviously is not uh, reaching everywhere but I wanted to uh, title it in such a way as to suggest that there were things that are connected here but not always in a very clear way. And that the connections may be mm, uh, leading to other places, because I'm very interested in that, but I'm not exactly sure where. Uh, we know everything is connected to everything, but in this case, there's a certain, yeah, like, a set of things that, now, that's a, that's a hard thing to justify, um, unless um, uh, uh, you know that I really didn't at the time understand as much about the show as I do now. And so there were things um, that had to do with the connection uh, with what these glass pieces are and how they might connect to the jail and to the grommet horns that I, I was, I, I, I knew somehow this is accurate, but I didn't know what the middle piece was. So it's like around two corners. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's, it's funny to me that you say that there was a lot of things that weren't clear to you mm -hmm. when so much of what we're talking about is transparency. Right. Yeah, that's so right. for me, that was a funny choice of words because mm -hmm. we're talking about these passages, things to be looked through, things that are both you know, the jail, which is both uh, a thing to obfuscate the video and something that the video moves through. Um, that the, it's a jail cell that has open doors, that is open from the back. Yeah. It's not about confinement, right? It's about things yeah. passing through. Materially, that's true, you know, but the, the, um, the way in which the uh, ideas of the works um, collide and uh, intersect is not, a, is not as transparent as that. Right. Uh, on, uh, and all I'm saying is that, for me, the ideas weren't transparent at all, but very opaque, right. somehow. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, uh, because, uh, you know, now, we, now that we're here, uh, it's a show that's almost invisible in some ways. And um, the idea of doing something like that, uh, but with material work, was 
uh, it's not unfamiliar completely. I mean, uh, because of these tiles, I think of Carl Andre's uh, floor tiles. And <coughs> but honestly, this is a com uh, co this is operating in a completely different mode, right. and it's in a completely different setting, and yet it's also invisible in that way. Right. Um, so, in in terms of you finding in the lead up to the exhibition, the idea is being a bit more opaque or a bit more uncertain or this idea of indeterminacy because there were gestures that you were doing that you just knew they were the gestures to do <coughs> without necessarily knowing Pardon. exactly every reason why. I remember yeah, when yeah. we talked about the glass pieces, uh, what, a year ago now? Yeah. There was this un you weren't clear on, on what, why you had done it. But yeah. this is something that I, I found interesting too with, so with the, <laughs> with the jail movie, um, you have this indeterminacy of, of is this a finished thing, mm. right? Mm. Because it's something that you shot in what eighty two and eighty three. Oh, it's um, no, uh, it, it's a question of what the boundaries around the piece are, right. and uh, and then whether uh, see I, I'm the the uh, the jail film as such is un completely unfinished, but I am using. The, the, work, the, the images in this context in a way that's, that's finished, right. you know. So it's, I mean, I, uh, I, I mean if, if we wanted, we could go into whether I'm borrowing from myself or, you know, what actually the uh, beginning and end of the work is. Right. But this doesn't really interest me. Well, that was much. what I was going to ask: was that it, does it matter to you? Does no. It, does it matter that it's something that you <coughs> that you might still go back and finish? Oh, I'd like to very yeah. much. Yeah. Right. Um, and yeah. so, since we're talking about the film, um, uh -oh. can you? You're right. No. <laughs> I, I just have a cold that won't go away. It's from a month ago. And it just sits right here and chokes me. Do you want more so, water? No, I've got more water. Okay. It doesn't, and I've got uh, slippery elm bark, and I'm um, doing everything I can except uh, using um, anesthetizing spray, you know. <clears throat> but I don't have that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so with the film. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. In terms of the structure and how it was made. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a couple things I want to sort of tease out of you a little bit. Is one is the idea of, of the, the prison cell in your studio, which mm -hmm. was always a set. It was never an actual cell. And now we have a replica of a set. Mm -hmm. um, but also the structure on which you sort of directed the actors, the, the scenarios that you provided with which they could improvise within. Yeah. Um, and since so much of what that film and that installation is about is about power structures. Mm -hmm. I wonder mm -hmm. your relationship to improvisation in that, with yeah. this idea of power. Yeah. Well, this goes into the details of these uh, different pieces in a way that may be so uh, complicated that it doesn't interest any of you. And so if you look bored, then we can change the subject, you know. <laughs> but uh, I could say that it, for each of the, the different pieces in the show, that um, there's a, a long ramping up, you know, it's taken time, each, each thing has taken time. It's like, see, the glass pieces started off, like, about three years ago. They started off because I had a, um, a picture in a frame about like this, and um, I took the picture out, and there was just glass in the frame, and I made a hole in the glass. It's not easy to do. In fact, the glass broke the first time, you know. So then I do another one. And I started buying, uh, I started buying uh, pictures at, you know, that, uh, that people had left on the, uh, uh, were selling at, uh, out of, at the, at the, uh, in their front yard or, uh, that I found in the street, and I would take them home and make holes in them, you know, in the glass, and just and take the pictures out. And so I have uh, different uh, things like, and, and they started getting bigger. Yeah, 
because uh, I realized that I was having trouble with the ones that were small because the glass always broke. And so I made them bigger. And gradually, they got to be a certain size that I liked. And I realized that I wanted to actually just buy glass in larger pieces and try working with them. And this is when the frames came off. So then the frame is off. Now I've got just big pieces of glass that I started drilling holes in them. And it, 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 it's, it's fun, you know, so, well, it's not fun. In fact, it's so, sort of stupid work because I had to um, figure out how to um, hold the, the drill very steady. And you have a special uh, saw that's with diamond on it a diamond saw, and you have to always pour water on it. You pour water on it and you drill very steady. So I had a, a, a device and uh, to make this possible. And uh, then it takes quite a long time. It's not so quick, you know, it takes a long time. And so I'm drilling holes in these large pieces of glass. And then I, th I thought, oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to show them? You know, like, I hadn't even thought about it. At that point, I hadn't even uh, thought for a moment uh, that it would be uh, interesting to display these things, you know. But then um, I uh, had a show scheduled at uh, Green Naftali in New York, and I, said, I told uh, Carol Green that I wanted to hang this piece of glass with a hole in it, and she seemed uh, skeptical, yeah. But then, you know, she was skeptical for a good reason because, how, you know, we didn't, she didn't understand what it meant to hang it. Like, would I frame it? Or I said, no, I don't want to frame. I want it to just stand in, you know, with no nothing. You see, like, I, that would be preferred. I'd like it just with no apparent support. It should just be in the air. Yeah, well, it turns out it's actually very difficult to do the, yeah, I mean, like, this is a, brilliant solution that was worked out by the staff here where you, uh, it, you know, you use special German engineering or uh, Austrian engineering <laughs> and you get um, it, like the glass held in these clamps and then, uh, so fact, yeah. And okay, if that's not bad. It would be nice if they would just stand in the middle of the air, but they're very heavy. And so that holding them, like holding the edge like this, even I didn't want very much on the edge, just holding a little on the edge, uh, they, they broke it in New York. You know, and so this became then a whole, uh, you know, I'm just saying it's a whole evolution and when it came to finally looking at the glass in a show situation, I thought, Whoa, it's fantastic. <laughs> they look fantastic. They have, they're full of ideas. All of the ideas that I was sort of like working through all along uh, uh, were all there. And in the meantime, it, the uh, pieces look uh, just um, uh, so absolutely different from the uh, other kinds of work so, like, um, I was invited to a group show in London, uh, like, beginning of the year or something like that. And I said, I want to show this glass piece in the show. You know, I never went to the show, but they managed to hang the glass piece. And when I looked at the documentation of the show, there was all of these art, art pieces. You know, like, art, you know, artworks. Art, art, there was art here, art here, art there, art there. And then there was this big piece of glass with a hole in it. And I thought, yes, yeah. It's just like n nothing. It's like weird, yeah, good, you know. But at the same time, I realized that what really fascinated me about it was that uh, you had to look through the hole. You know, like, there it is, and you either you look through the hole, or maybe it's a little too high, and you, you know, and I'm like, I'm over here, and I'm looking through the hole now. 
you know, like, you, I can't help it. There's a hole in the glass. I look through the hole, okay? But then my brain, yeah, good work. Thank you. This it's is a high, great book. It's high. For I know, it is high. <laughs> but you see, it's also sort of like a human scale. Uh, so it's a portrait. It's high for certain people. It's a, a, it's a kind of a portrait that uses um, aspects of binocular vision collapsed onto one place. Because, it, it, you know, the other part of it is you, you can't really look through one hole with two eyes. <laughs> You know, so uh, there's all kinds of problems that aren't apparent at first. Uh, but the the fact that that the, the uh, that this hole somehow draws the, your eye to it uh, reminded me of the problem that came up in early minimal art uh, when uh, Michael Fried, in a famous article, complained that uh, minimal art was. Uh, garbage because uh, you uh, basically the viewer came and recognized the object immediately and this made it into theater and I thought uh, this is related to that argument but very very different and goes in a different direction completely because of the splitting of the view vision that there's a uh, there's a kind of way in which, like, looking through the hole is all about gaze, what they call technically, like in movie uh, theory, gaze. And if you look, on the other hand, just through the glass, it's just like looking through the glass, you know, like looking out the window or whatever, you know. It's, so there's looking and gaze that are simultaneous and co-present. Uh, and, you know, Honestly, I was increasingly suspicious about this idea of gaze uh, just because it's such a good idea. I hate good ideas, you know. <laughs> and uh, I hated the idea that this gaze theory, the theory of gaze, sort of like uh, so mm, elegantly uh, deals with gender issues in relation to Art, uh, art and performance and so forth, like the male gaze we talk about, men looking at, well, presumably at women, but also at men, but, you know, like, but that, well, that's neither here nor there. It's like this idea of the gazing subject as a, a representing some kind of <coughs> desire that's coming out through the eyes, and, um, uh, and I think, this is so weird, you know, it's like uh, the Greek theory of vision where the vision is coming out of the eyes and this has to be, we have to somehow do something new. There has to be a basis for a new idea about what looking is about <coughs> that's, not, that's not dealing with a force coming out of you <coughs> like that. And I think that this helps Because of <clears throat> this helps because it's ambiguous in that respect, because it represents simultaneously the gaze and just looking. Uh, that wasn't the question. That was better than I. <coughs> that was went, way, 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 way. <laughs> but you asked about yeah. the jail, and I, I, and I started yeah. to talk about. This. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask about those anyway. Yeah. Um, mm. But with the jail, you've, you've got this gaze, too, because you've got this, this sort of gender swapping, and you've got this sort of the power structure <coughs> of, of this exploitation film. <coughs> the, pardon me, pardon me. Oh, you don't have to excuse me, but yeah. this, I'll do this, keep doing this, yeah. <laughs> yes, because you played with the, the genre of a woman in prison <laughs> exploitation film, right, which is, you know, you're trying to f sort of invert that gaze in some ways, or play with it, or address it, well, honestly, that wasn't in, uh, in my head at that time. And also, the, uh, the logic of gaze hadn't really been, um, it hadn't fully come fully to my attention. I, I mean, uh, Laura Mulvey's article, I think, is before that. But, you know, the, um, the idea of uh, gaze wasn't fully developed by the time I started this in, 
82, and, uh, 1982. But what I had done previously was, and that you haven't seen, you see, what you haven't seen was another film that I made that was uh, called uh, Hail the Fallen. And this is an ironic sort of gung-ho title. Uh, it was uh, a film that I uh, shot when I was uh, uh, living in California for half a year. And it was, uh, um, I, I had the idea that I wanted to, I wanted to make a film that would be about the relationship between a character who's in charge and a character who is under control. But uh, then the reason I wanted to do this was that I was thinking about art at the time. I was thinking about art in, in the relationship to heroics. See, like, because in a way, art is something that is up there. And you think, oh, yeah. And so the art is always somehow in charge over me. Or, you know, like, I submit to the art, yeah. And there's a kind of weird transfer of, of authority and, and, and power and some kind of honor, honor, a relation of honor or uh, a psychological engagement with the art that, that, that's still interesting to me, although today I analyze it very differently. But at that time, I could see that a lot of old art was about heroes. You know, like the, there was a, there's a very near my house, there's a big sculpture in the middle of a circle of a guy on a horse with a hat and a sword, you know, like he obviously did something, but I, no one cares, but it's like a hero, you know, and he's up there. And I think like, okay, that's easy. I can make art about a hero. And is that cool or interesting? I hate that. See, like I don't, you know, like I'd be happy to take that, well, I, I'm not, you know, it's like, you remember what happened to the, what was the statue of Lenin? And it, but I don't, I don't, I don't need to knock this, this statue down. It's in my head already down, you know. But if I'm going to make art, I don't want to make art about heroes. I want to make art about pathetic, poor creeps. You see, like nerds and basically, uh, yeah, the lost souls. And uh, so I made a, I made a chart of all of the relationships that would have to be in this film. See, like, this, the officer should swear a lot, like, yeah, goddamn, blah, 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 you know, like that. But the, um, the uh, soldier who's under control, they should, should, uh, shouldn't even care. Should not care, doesn't care, you know, like, so the officer says, go get that cushion. And the, uh, and the soldier is like, okay, you know, go get the cushion, but doesn't really give a shit, you see, like about this. And uh, so uh, I tried to structure these two parts so that one is like basically somebody I would like to know, which is like somebody who is not, is not going to play this game. And it's just like doing their own thing. And the other role is just somebody locked into authoritarian uh, power position. Okay, so this was good. And I just made a list of rules. And then I got a lot of people and I gave them uniforms. <laughs> and I told them, go for it. You know, okay, this time we're going to do the, uh, the scene where, uh, yeah, like uh, your uh, uh, drill in the field, like marching. And so the guys who were marching, they look horrible, you know. And the, uh, and the guys in charge are saying, one, two, three, four, you know, like this. And it's really a parody. It looked horrible. The film looked horrible. It looked just ridiculous. And then I talked to people who were, had been in the army, and they said, it's exactly like that. <laughs> yeah, 
That's exactly the way it is, really. Um, but uh, there were some problems with the film that I didn't, I hadn't expected that were a really, really interesting to me. And that had to do with who was I? Like, was I in charge? And what, what, how would I direct, you see? Like, what point of view did I represent? And what about the audience? Who, then I'm a stand in for the audience if I'm shooting the film. It, so what role is the audience? And I think the audience is a bunch of officers. So the audience should be thinking like, what's going on with this stupid film here? This uh, film looks horrible. Yeah, I hate this film. Who made this film? Some stupid jerk. Yeah, I made this <laughs> film. And so I made the film like that. And when I showed it, the audience thought, who made this stupid film? You know, like, this looks horrible. And I realized I had built the, built the attitude of the, uh, of, the, of the situation into the audience situation. And I thought, yes, fantastic. It's a, a, kind, of, um, a kind of film making that's never been done before where you create the role of the audience by structuring the, vi the vision of the, of, of the viewer, structuring the viewer in such a way that they have a psychological relationship to the film that is like something you planned. Yeah, <laughs> I thought, very cool that nobody likes it. But then I, I realized, I wanted to try again, try again, because there were a lot of things that weren't perfect, I hadn't worked out, I can't even go there right now, but I mean, just to give you a tip, you know, there's the question of uh, uh, like, okay, if I'm directing the actors, what kind of power relation is that, you see, I mean, like, it's just like a mess. So I thought, Okay, I had done this other film by adopting the role of soldier and officer as just a two parts as a model. So I thought, I this is like an ar a, you know like an army film or something like that. I'd, I'll make a prison film. So there's a genre of prison film which is women's prison film. You know, cool. Like a lot of people like this grade B genre film, women, women in prison. So I had a lot, a, lo, uh, a lot, of, I had a woman a collaborator, I had a lot of women dresses that I found, uh, yeah, like uh, being sold uh, somewhere that were just like institutional looking uh, dre dresses. And I just gave everybody a dress and said, you know, and I said, you know, this is not about a cross dressing or transvestites or anything like that. This is just like, that's the costume. Okay. And then I, then I put the people in, built a jail set like this. Yeah. And then I just got my friends and artists that I knew and so forth. And I put them in there and I, told them, you know, like sort of, these are the rules. There's a guard, there's in charge, and blah, 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 yeah. And I wanted them to then improvise dialogue and activities of all kinds, because I had in mind that in the context of the prison, that something happens about language and time that I wanted to explore, which is like, I think, uh, I thought, okay, we probably say all the same things over and over and over during our lives. You know, like when you're a child, you learn to say certain things, and then you think, well, now I'm an adult, I say all different things. But probably the things you say as a child are pr very similar to the things you say when you're grown up. And you, when you're my age, then you're still saying the same crap. You know, it's like, and I, with this thought in mind, I felt like what I want to do is I'll wait a long time and then I'll get all the same people back and they'll say the same things. So I transcribed all of this dialogue, you know, copied it all out so that I could have it 
uh, memorized for the next time. But by that time, I, re I didn't have money to shoot the second part. And I waited, you know. <laughs> I'm still waiting, yeah. And it's, uh, but it's only 35 years, so, you know, like, <laughs> Uh, and uh, now I'm in, I've been back in touch with many of the people who are you, who you see here. Some of their lives have changed, so they would they would not do this anymore. But a lot of them are are um, are yeah really ready. You know they they're excited. They think oh yeah the jail film. Let's do the jail film again. Yeah we're gonna do it again. Exciting. You know like good. Yeah. So that's where this uh, footage comes from. Uh, not, you see, not without a lot of thoughts behind it. It's, uh, implica it's, uh, it implicates a lot of different uh, ide idea streams. The way it's being used here is not coherent with that. It's being used in a different way. It's being used in a way that has to do with the transparency of the set. And the reason that I wanted to focus on the set itself, that is the jail architecture, is that I became fascinated by the transparency that it shows and the way that it's like ambiguous in its transparency, just like this is. You know, like, for example, it's very hard to look at these bars without seeing the bars behind them and getting them all moirade and confused and like, they do fascinating things. They, they impose uh, a, a structure uh, that's like a grid, but I'm not into the grid as such. It's not like I'm trying to make a grid painting or something, but they, they both are there very strongly, and then they vanish. So they're painted yellow for a reason, and that's to make them very, very evident. But at the same time, they're there to, to look past. You look past them and through them because, uh, uh, because we're interested not in the bars, but as people, we recognize that this is... I mean, it looks like a jail. You have to admit, it does look like a jail. It's not a jail. You, there's no, you know, like it's just, it's so weak. You could uh, go over and knock it down easily. Any, anybody here could knock it down very easily because it's not very strong. And it's, it looks like it might be real, but it's really not. And uh, so we can't help, but we have to see it as if it's a jail, as if it really prevents you from going anywhere. You can't go through it because it looks like a jail. <laughs> uh, so there's a question about being inside or outside. And this uh, it, like is very interesting to me about this particular structure that socially you can't be in the presence of this without the question of like, am I, in, I'm outside, yeah, I'm not inside, you know, like, if I, I could be inside, you know, no, not me, I'm never inside, yeah, I never go inside, I'm always outside, but see, like all of these questions about my identity with relation to inside, outside, all of this, this is, like automatically there, and for this reason, I want the doors open. You know, it's not like uh, the, the the doors are 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 closed, so you can't go in. You could even go in, and the door could then be closed. But uh, yeah, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity about what 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 this has to do with being inside or outside. And, and, and so what about the, uh, what about the grid? You know, like, who cares about the grid anymore? It's about these, uh, uh, so the social construct of space. What the space is, 
that you're in and what it means to be in a certain space, you know. Now, I mean, I think that we're, in a sense, uh, also, um, uh, all of us already, always already confined in many ways. You know, we're already in. We're captured. We're, you know, like under conditions of control and authority and so forth. So that, uh, I mean, if, if, if there were someone who n had no socialization or social memory or whatever, and so they saw this, it wouldn't mean anything to them. But for all of us, e but because we all have conditions of confinement and, and control, this can't help but do, do things like that. Uh, and this relates to the, 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 the transparency of the boundary. I wanted to ask... I know, I'm just like, No, 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 no. Is this bad? I'm this just, is great. Well, I'm nobody glad, wants, glad, nobody glad, wants to hear glad, me. Glad. Um, no, but I wanted well, I would to, like to hear I, you. I just wanted to ask because there's another outside that we've got now with this installation here at Carlsplatz. Oh, yeah, because I know, I know. This you've outside. Set, I you've, know. you've set up a couple yeah. different insides and outsides yeah. now because there is, you know, these people driving by, especially at night when this is mm -hmm. illuminated. Mm -hmm. There's another, and how, for you, I know you were a bit surprised yeah. by seeing how much of a hub this yeah. area was. Yeah. How, has that transformed it up further? Well, uh, Gareth, when you first approached me about this, and then you told me that the whole space is surrounded by glass, I thought this sounded really very weird. It's like, I don't know of any <coughs> exhibition space, first of all, that's like this. It's more like a shop window in a big store. You know, like, I, if, I, if, I, if I looked to find this anywhere else, I would expect to see mannequins and, you know, like maybe giant candy bars or something, you know, like, something like that. Um, or people uh, serving, um, what would they serve here? Um, uh, they would serve uh, uh, coffee. coffee. There you yes. go. That's an yes, easy answer. I am thinking of coffee too, yes. Yeah, maybe we should all have a cup of coffee. Yeah, but anyway, I should have brought coffee, but okay. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's uh, seriously, it, it, it invites the thoughts of, of looking through into this space. Uh, but then he told me there's a, uh, that there's a way to walk a, 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 a beside it. Um, and so people might walk beside it and look in. And I thought, well, that's interesting, you know. So when I got here, I was astonished to find, no, it's not about walking beside it. There's a huge avenue in front of it with traffic, and I didn't know about that. Yeah, so it, 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 sorry, it sorry, was, sorry, it was surprising to, to me how. Uh, but at the same time, I was, I thought, oh my God, it's right in the middle. It's in the hub of the city. It's like a, it, it's so wonderfully positioned as a place to show things that I feel very, I really feel very privileged to have an opportunity to, be, to have a show that's situated visibly in a place where, you know, like millions of people can go by and ignore it. <laughs> well, you've also given them a mostly transparent show, right? That's right. So you've kind of, yeah, you've that's right. taken yeah. this opportunity and you've kind of uh, intentionally yeah. scuppered it, right? Like Except for the jail. Well, yes. Which, I mean, I'm sure that there are people who drive by and after they drive by to work every day for two weeks, you know, they'll say, uh, uh, Liebling, <laughs> hast du mal etwas gesehen am Karlsplatz? Es gibt so ein solcher Dings da. <laughs> or whatever, you know, they say, well, what was that? Yeah, so I hope, I mean, you know, it's like curious, maybe, uh, you know. And uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't mind that there's a spectacle involved, yeah. And then you... And in a way, the transparency of the glass is like, the, 
a converse spectacle. Exactly. It's uh, the opposite of spectacle. It's by being invisible, but at the same time compelling. Mm -hmm. It's like very, it plays the game, you know. And as I say, I know Carl Andre played this game, but what's interesting is that in, the, in that work from the 60s, that the, uh, the, the game that was being played was being played on a different field. You know, it was a completely different set of uh, goals and ideas. So in that regard, I, I, I really am very fond of the idea that it, today, mm, yeah, I mean, in a way, like, uh, didn't, you must, you all know about art and so forth, you know. Like in a few years ago, people started saying, okay, everything's been done, there's nothing new anymore. You know, we're just not gonna do anything new anymore. So, you know, like everybody just do whatever you want and, you know, like it doesn't matter anymore. We have no guidelines for what, what's important or new or blah, 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 blah. Yeah, well, okay, that's, that's a point of view. But it's kind of like a forlorn giving up in my mind. I think that's like just lazy thinking because what, it, what we're really saying is that we have now a position where we see a lot of entry points. And it's possible for an artist or, or, or a viewer or any creative person to pick up the fascination that exists at any point uh, historically in terms of time, space, you know, all these things are the same. You know, that is in terms of a cultural tradition or, you know, like, uh, you can do, um, like, early 9th, 20th century comic books. Or you can remake movies. Or you can do Velasquez. Or you can do, you know, like, there's places where you can go and, and take those ideas, works, traditions, elements and bend them in new ways and I, I think this is like a very sort of powerful thing to do so I like the idea of going to key junctures in the system of art thinking and then finding ways to take those things in directions that are completely novel and unexpected and don't tell me nothing is new because you can certainly take things in a new direction, because a lot of times the things that were done earlier were done in a way that when you look back, you see, you know, this is a function of personality and, and so forth, you know, like, uh, like um, for example, I mean, a big departure, I'll take one example, you know. Okay, um, let's take um, Alfred Jarry and the Ubu play. Okay, so this became a scandal because Alfred Jarry had the character come to the front of the stage and say, Mel. Okay, so, you know, like, okay, but if you know about Alfred Jarry and you know anything about the situation and his personality, the idea that he would have his character come out and yell shit at the audience, you know, it's like makes perfect sense. It's not like a great discovery or conceptual revolution. It's a, a personal, a fantastic personal uh, development, you know. And so I, it would be interesting to go back there and do a different personality with that, you know, but to, to take it somewhere else, you know. I'm not saying I'm gonna do that in real time now. Good. That would be, I would have to scare you, right? You know, but I'm not going to do that, you know. I'm too nice and too weak. Oh, it's like not, it's too aggressive. I can't do that aggressive thing. But you'll manage. Yeah, no. Um, should, should we he open? used to carry a gun around too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a long, a big gun. A big, a big long one. Like, because he was very small. He would take it. Carry, used to carry a gun. Yeah. Okay. It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And he used to use the ether. Well, that was pretty common. Uh, should we open it up to questions? Uh, we can do that. Yeah, sure. And we can come back from there too. 
Yeah. Oh, did I? You had some questions you were going to ask me. You, know, you I know cover you, a lot of it. He threatened <laughs> me. He told me he was going to ask me questions that I would have trouble with. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, can any of you... Maybe that was a yeah, joke. I can't imagine you having trouble with any question. Um, no, but do you guys have... Somebody must. Really? No. Last week, I nobody was chatting. There we, there all we go. All of the questions. Exactly. Great. Oh, yeah, the, the sound. Oh, yeah. The yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, well, this... Uh, this piece that we called grommet horn, you know, it came about uh, autonomously. It's not a product of this show. Uh, and um, uh, this, uh, I, I, I built this, these are reconstructions, you know, because I really like this uh, piece. But the first one, the first one that I made, I made uh, in the 70s, in the 1970s. And at that time, um, uh, well, I was interested in musical instruments of various kinds. And um, I realized that one of the things that had always been involved in with music instruments was making them loud enough so that people could hear them. Like if you go through all the different kinds of instruments, like brass instruments and string instruments and so forth, they're all made, you know, like you have a string, uh, a string on a guitar like this, and then you have this giant box, which is there so you can hear it. Uh, and you have a horn on the end of a, of a, of a trumpet so you can hear it. Um, and uh, today, it's, first of all, not necessary to have instruments that are loud, like electric guitar is very soft. Uh, and second of all, it occurred to me that it would be nice to make instruments that were basically inaudible, that were very soft. And uh, so I was playing around, just playing, playing with things, you know, and I realized that it just air going through a hole without any whistling or anything, like no, nothing to make it better, you know, just the air going through a hole was making nice sound, you know, and that it would be different sound depending on how bit, the shape of the hole that it's going through. <coughs> so I just made this box with um, different size holes different shapes of holes uh, and uh, then I realized that I could actually uh, play it like this. like that and I just love this idea yeah that it's so so stupid and so that it works and it's fun to do and it's easy that's another thing no talent required yeah which I think it's wonderful, you know. Uh, so many, almost, so, so many, uh, just the other day somebody told me that they used to play the uh, blah, 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 I forget what it was, the cello or the piano or something, but they can't really ma play music anymore. And I thought, that's stupid, you know, you just make it, you know. Find the sound that you like and, you know, then if you enjoy it, you enjoy it. You know, if you want to make music, you just start and see what you like. And in this case, uh, you start with uh, something that no one can complain about, first of all, because <laughs> it's very soft, and second of all, because people, people think it's ridiculous to begin with. You know, it doesn't go anywhere, it just is there. It's like the radiator. You know, do they, what's a radiator of Deutsch? Uh, I'm the wrong one to There's a Heizung uh, thing that makes, that goes like, you know, it's the same thing. You know, so like, or a tea kettle. Yeah, it's the same same idea. And so um, uh, uh, then, uh, when I was making this show, I realized that this uh, uh, the the idea of the whole and the transparency 
in some sense, has its analog in this uh, weird uh, grommet horn, <laughs> as I call it. Yeah, your grommet horn, stupid, but yeah, it's a horn. It's a kind of horn. It would, uh, and these grommet is the name for the little rubber thing that goes in the hole. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so it's like a grommet horn. Uh, somehow, mm, uh, it somehow fit for me. Again, you know, like there were two degrees of separation. It wasn't quite, it didn't, it wasn't like this is correct or it fits or something like that or it's an, you know, but there were certain relationships and, and differences that I liked very much and, 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 I, and I do. And that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that you could that there's another question about these uh, paintings on the on the side walls. Yeah. You know that don't, that are uh, not uh, exactly obvious why they would uh, go either. You know, but but uh, one of the reasons that's not too obvious is because it, of the fact that uh, it um, it uh, it's uh, echoing some deep, prolonged thinking of mine that no one needs to hear about. <laughs> you know? but, um, but that has to do with the uh, beginnings of, um, in some way, uh, the beginning of, of uh, linear perspective in Western painting. You know? And this is, like I was saying, you can go back in history, see, and pick some area, and then you think, like, what happens if this went a different way? What happened if it went at the, and here's this fantastic, rich thing, linear perspective, that was a compulsion within Western art for 500 years, 500 years. And now we just say, we don't even think it's irrelevant. <laughs> what about it? linear perspective? Who gives a shit, you know? And, 500 years, it's just like, poof. in the meantime, this camera, your camera, everybody's phone, all pictures, everything we see, the movies, TV, it's all linear perspective. So there's some weird difference between the reality and the art that's not just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just talking about reality as nature or something, I'm talking about like the um, the manufactured or made uh, artifice, uh, the art, the 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 culture of artifice around us is divided in a weird way that the um, uh, conceptual aspirations of art have have peeled off in a way that's very strange. And yet, you know, now we have TV and video and film and photographs as art, but we're not uh, thinking of that as commentary in, on linear perspective. Okay, anyway, so I was interested in trying to figure out why, why was linear perspective thought up anyway? Like where did they come from, you know? Like why suddenly? What, what, because it didn't happen everywhere else, it just happened in uh, uh, like Florence. What? Crazy! All of a sudden, you've got linear perspective in Florence. What? Don't tell me it was just like made up out of nothing. This doesn't happen, you know. And when I studied this uh, situation, I found that there were so many things that influenced this development that it was like really, really almost impossible for me to untangle them. I mean, I would just name, like, for example, um, uh, charging interest. You know, it doesn't seem right, but, you know, charging interest in the old church was like a sin. And yet, here's, uh, and so capitalism starts, and people are charging interest, and the guys who are charging interest are guilty, and they have to do something, so they make themselves into saints in paintings. <laughs> you know, but it has to look real. They have to look real. You know, so 
that's one thing. And then, uh, so linear book, uh, double entry bookkeeping and the use of, uh, of Arabic numerals come into very important role. And the, the structure of the court, the ducal court, is very important. And um, the p position of the church, naturally, and where people sit in church, and the fact they have to sit still. Because if everybody were moving around, linear perspective wouldn't work. That's probably why you have to sit in a movie, you know. But it's also why when we have installations, we can move around. You know, and the structure of installation uh, imagery, like uh, TV and moving images and installations, the structure of the image is completely different. It doesn't have uh, continuity and beginning and end and everything like that. It becomes, it's, a, it's a choreography with a moving viewer. Yeah, so here's a screen with an image and the, and the viewer is now choreographed in relation to the image. And so the, 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 the images have a completely different logic to them, you know. I mean, I just say that because I, I did film for a long time and it's like bizarre how different making film for installation can be from making a film. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, those are some examples. So uh, one of the things that was influential was architecture. And this is very clear because one of the person who's, who's identified most, most uh, you know, sort of like uh, mm, uh, most uh, articulate, who, who's most, uh, who most of the legends pinpoint as uh, author of uh, linear perspective is Brunelleschi. And he was a great architect, you know. So he was somebody who had to use drawings of three-dimensional space to, on two dimensions in order to design buildings. And it makes perfect sense to me that an architect would be the person who would invent linear perspective because that's what the problem is, is how you get three dimensions in two dimensions. And so the most stupid way to do it is by having a side view, a top view, and, uh, and, the other, and the other side view. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna make some linear perspective drawings of these glass pieces, you see. And that's what you see here. Um, the ones, the large ones are one to one. They're exactly the size as, of these glass pieces. The smaller ones are five to one and 10 to one. Yeah, so the, they, the small ones are correct. The big ones are, are sort of stupid because, you know, it's like the map is the same size as the territory. But. And it's funny that you made them after the, after the class things. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The yeah. diagram for making them. Oh, yeah, the, made well, I didn't use them to yeah. make it, yeah. <laughs> oh, so next time, maybe, yeah. Maybe. That's not what you sent us when we had to fabricate these. Let's see, I'm probably making a, a mess out of the time schedule because you probably want to go home. But uh, you had one more question, huh? I have lots more questions, but we're not going to cover them all. Oh, Don't what worry. are we going to do with the you, questions? You, you Why don't you just you rattle them off and I'll answer oh, no. them really quickly. Um, I can read some of the notes. Um, okay. Sur surveillance, new slash old. That's a question. Yeah. We've I talked know. about peepholes. We've talked about that kind of surveillance. I and know. I was wondering if you have it... I sort of, you talked about this as sort of old surveillance, yeah. right? And there's some yeah. of that in the film. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? Well, there's like, these fascinating things that pop up. You see, like I'm fascinated, this is again a two degrees of separation, you know, but I'm fascinated by the fact that the early telescope is called a spyglass. Yeah. I don't know if it's in German, so a spyglass. For a, Anyone know? Okay. They don't know either. Maybe they don't speak German. Maybe. <laughs> or, Some don't. Yeah. Huh? Some don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you speak German? No. Me? Yeah. No. No. Okay. Shada. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I've got lots, but I'm. Okay, I, one I more. One more. One more. Better. Let's hear one more. All right, let's talk about sex, Tony. 
We've got all these holes no. and passages and things let's, going in and out of holes. Where's let's it? go to the next question. See, there you go. I knew I could, I knew I could make him shut up. Um, yeah, but does anyone else? There are some sex stories, but that, that they, they're private. I'll get them later. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Oh, the, the, the little door ones. A spine. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's yeah, spying. Uh, I think of um, I think of the image uh, from a comic book of old times of the, uh, the boys uh, peeping through little holes to see the ball game or to see uh, the girl or to see the whatever it is. You know. Okay. Next, uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment. Wait. So in 1971, there was a Stanford oh. Prison Experiment. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was wondering if the film has oh. a relationship to that. Where I mean. It's pretty famous or infamous, but um, yeah, in 71, they set up uh, nine prisoners, nine guards, and had them act out or see how they would react to these sort of positions yeah. of subordination and positions of authority, and it kind of went out of hand. Uh, and they yeah. saw actual sort of sadom, sadom, like sadistic behavior. They saw, yes, yes, yeah. And I was wondering, because it was about Did 10, I have 10 years. that happen? Well, a bit of, yeah. of how much, like, was this an influential thing, but also did you have, did you see some of the prisoners start behaving like prisoners? Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, not really in that way, yeah, yeah. I think the most uh, nasty prisoner I had was Mike Kelly. Surprise, because, surprise. But he's naturally na a nasty person, uh, which I love about him, or yeah, did, yeah. Uh, but, um, but not really, you know. I don't think, but you know, also sexually, just like, oh, well, anyway, you know, <laughs> you can see any of his shows, and right. then you sort of get the yeah. same persona, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I won't. But this yeah. this appearance of Mike Kelly in 1983 is kind of interesting because it's quite early for him. It's before his uh, real uh, career, uh, and uh, the. Uh, and the uh, ele larger elements of his uh, influence were apparent, you know. So it's really intriguing to see him in these. And he's in the uh, yeah, the army film counts, too. Counts and it's it's really interesting, you know. But then I was in uh, early performance of his uh, that he came and did in Buffalo, and um, no one sees this work because he wouldn't allow it to be recorded. But we recorded it, so we have a recording. The only recording was of Mike Kelly's earliest performance work, which is fantastic, was the recording made in Buffalo. And I'm in it, and I'm really proud of that because it's like great stuff, yeah. <laughs> that was, I think, in 81 or 82. Okay, so around Maybe 82, 82 because that's he when he was doing this, yeah. Okay, now, now, so do you want to ask more? No, I mean, we're, we've got... We can ask them yeah, one exactly. more time. We can give them a count of ten to ask some questions or make a comment that would be good. No? So now after you arrived um, without any really knowledge of what this place was going to be, Yeah. And I say that too because I'm happy I have the advantage. I, I got scared about four days ago in the middle of the night and I said, oh yeah, yeah what is this all gonna be? Because I have no idea, though I know Vienna, we know Vienna very well and we know the Karlsplatz, but we had no idea what this is. Yeah. So I have the advantage that in eight months I'm going to do something here, but I had a It's a uh, Charlemagne, Palestine. I had yes. a nightmare and so you came much more innocently and you've done all this, so it's very heroic somehow because look at this amazing. We're in the, the scene. Of a, yeah. yeah, I mean it's a, mm -hmm. uh, it's an amazing. But thing my favorite there. is this. The, behind the jail is the snail garden. Did you know that? No. Yeah, the snail <laughs> garden. Yeah, and I didn't know what it was. You know, I just saw. Oh, what are these boards here? And so the guy came and he said, look, you look under the boards and there's snails. Ah, so it's a real snail garden. It's a snail garden, yeah. Does everybody know that? 
Schneck, you know about what is it? Schnecker? Schnecker. Schnecker. And they're 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 in there. They're happy because it's rain. Yeah, and it's nice and wet and the snails are very happy. So I like that it's very slow there and very fast here. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for both, yeah. actually, about Gareth and your position as a curator in this exhibition. Um, is this going out of selecting the pieces, or is there an indication of Connie and Tony and selecting what he wanted to exhibit? Because you would have known then about the glass, and then this would have been no sort of coincidence. Yeah, I mean, the glass things were something that I had seen in New York, and I was I was definitely interested in, in using those as a, as a sort of architectural element in the space. But um, for me, and it's something I, I wrote about in the, in the booklet a bit, um, I mean, I started this talk tonight by introducing Tony as performer, musician, composer, and, and I, I feel hypocritical every time I do that because it makes me force these divisions on the parts of his practice that I don't think are real. I think the, the, his practice is one of those truly interdisciplinary in that the disciplines sort of meld together and those grommet horns are both instruments to be played, they're sculptures to be looked at, they're evidence of a performance, they're a thing that we've got a recording of, all at the same time. And so for me, this idea of, of, of the commas between all of the things that we have to identify Tony as, I think are, it's false punctuation. And so I wanted to use these glass things as an architectural <laughs> element to, to be sort of divisions in this space, right? Divisions or dividers that don't divide because they're sort of doubly dumb, they're transparent twice. So a thing that divides but then can't actually divide. So you can always see through them, you can always, you, you have to see the works through them. And luckily, this is something that Tony was also interested in, in using. Um, and at that point then it turned into a sort of a, a series of conversations and, and talking about his interests now and him wanting to work with the jail cell and the relationship between the jail cell and the glassworks as we've talked about a lot tonight, it all kind of made sense. So it was one of those, you know, a lot of conversation that we all, we seem to be quite, quite luckily, very easily on the same page. There's, you know, there's one thing that's really s surprising to me, and that is the door that you all came through is much more incredible than <laughs> these glass pieces. <laughs> But they're also quite similar. It's, huh? They're also quite similar with the, the finishing. It's similar. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's, a, it's the same shit, you know? And it's like, but, he, but see, like, this is what's weird about it, is that if you want this door, okay, then, you know, like, it's designed the, to have this door, and, the, the, and there's these guys who come and they put the door in, and it's done. With this... This was very difficult because they had to figure out how it, nobody's hanging it like this. You see what I mean? And it all had to be figured out and it was, uh, so oh, we found the, hard, the hardware and it turns out the hardware is the same kind of, you know, it's like the kind, what you would use. You know, but it's, uh, it's special, it's made specially and so it's much more, it took much more effort, I'm sure, to put one of these pieces than to put like a lot of these, you know, even though the, I mean, I think these are pretty fantastic, you know, and look, they're etched with these huge letters, <laughs> horrible letters, yeah, I don't like the letters. Did you consider putting holes directly in the walls? Yeah, yeah, I asked Jake Garrett, can we, can we make holes in the wall? Yeah, he said no. You should have asked, that was the problem. That's true. Done it, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it's not easy. <laughs> Also, one of your earliest thoughts was to change the letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so it would yeah. spell something else. I, I kind of wish you had done that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Good question, yeah. But I just, for the record, I just want to say, I did send Tony photos of the space. It wasn't, <laughs> it, it wasn't like he didn't know that it was glass no, no, and no, it was no, outside. No, 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 I also got photos of it. You can't no, exactly. imagine, you can't imagine. No, I in a photo I what this is. Yeah, no. It's impossible. <laughs> Even, even a Spielberg film wouldn't have been 
No, it's really three-dimensional and sociological. No, 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 no. And it, it is interesting Fair. that the, the space is, you, you think it's a glass, you know. But when I approach it visually, the dominant elements of these uh, strings, uh, like the horizontal and vertical beams, are really strong uh, in the compositional sense. And, you know, like, uh, I mean, it's sort of uh, a brute uh, kind of uh, architectural Form. It's built more like a garage or something like that. It's it's really a glass harsh, garage. very harsh. Yeah, a glass garage. A gla the glass garage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gala. That would be a nice a, a new because there are Kunsthalles everywhere, but they don't feel like this. this no, could become the glass garage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that suggestion. <laughs> you can have that for your yeah. show. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to write that one down. Uh, so is that so, um, did you uh, did you like this? Was this okay? <laughs> I don't know. I think it was. Thank you. Somebody liked it. I, I enjoyed uh, <laughs> just having a the, having a chance to just talk and talk and talk. But maybe that was not the best way to go, you know. Maybe we should have all done something together, you know, like, um, what would we have done? I don't know, like, uh, mm, sing mm. a song, do a dance? Yeah, <laughs> corny, sit awful. Yeah, sit on the cushions. Yeah. yeah, I know, the cushions were they're, wasted, they're, huh? They're so sad, just looking <laughs> at them. Yeah. Beautiful. yeah. No, no, I but know. it's so sad to see nobody using them. No, but uh, you, you don't see, uh, you're not an animist. I, I see no. lots of creatures here already. Get ready for your show. Yeah, each one has a, its own little creature. I know, yeah, yeah. They do look like little things, don't they? <laughs> They're kind of scary. You don't see creatures? It's soldiers. <laughs> I thought, uh, I haven't even drunk yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think on that note... <laughs> thank you very yeah, thanks, much thank for you coming. Guys, thank and you guys. Thank you. And thanks, Gareth, for inviting me. I also want to, uh, I do want to make sure to take just a moment to sincerely thank uh, Nicholas and the staff here who have done just outstanding work in supporting this whole undertaking from beginning to end. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Yeah, so thank you, Gareth. And yeah, thanks for making it easy. Uh, yeah.